Plateau, and these are the last six books that I finished. I've started and stopped a lot of things recently. It's been a really hectic season of my life where just yesterday even, I left my job of almost two years, got out of a relationship recently, I'm finally done with college applications and job applications. Last weekend I took the test that I had been studying every day for the last seven months for and as of today I am a week or less than a week actually away from a month-long trip to Japan basically had a lot on my plate and I'm now on the other side of a lot of stressors so as things continue to settle down for me I have entered a long overdue period of calm where I can just stop and think and so as the year is coming to a close, something that I've been thinking about is my year-end favorite lists of the movies and the books and the albums of 2023. And as I started, you know, working on the list, I realized that I haven't talked about the last couple books that I've read. Some of them I did mention in videos like really briefly or just candidly. Others I'd mentioned I started them, but just never you know, really got around to saying what I thought about them. So anyways, Long preamble out of the way, here are six books, and this is what I think about them. Starting off with a bit of a buzzy one. So we have Eileen by Otessa Moshfeg. There's a movie adaptation that comes out this weekend, and I very much want to watch it. Technically, I'm not done with this one yet, but after recording this, I'm going to read the 80 or so pages I have left. Go watch the movie, I already have tickets, so going to do it. Anyways, I'll come back to this one later on in the video and do like a side-by-side -side book movie review, but I am like 150 pages in and this is what I think so far. So for context, this is my third Moshfeg. I've read My Year of Rest and Relaxation and Latvona and then Eileen. So going into this, I did have some expectations of what I was going to get, which was just like Moshfeg-isms of... A book that's super fast-paced, has like a lot of dark comedy, satire, it's sort of like gross out, obscene, something perverse and like wry and witty, blah blah blah. I'm not getting that. With Eileen, at least, it definitely leans into this slow burn, sort of more thriller, like genre thriller, with a sense of mounting dread. And the only like Moshfeg-ism or thing that is like familiar, consistent throughout all three books is... This also has a narrator that has intrusive thoughts that are offensive or self-deprecating, but it doesn't feel super plotty even though it is like a thriller. It relies really heavily though on atmosphere, relies solely on atmosphere if I'm being honest. Story-wise, nothing has happened yet. I'm two-thirds of the way through and could probably summarize the entire book in like one sentence, which is weird girl who hates her life meets attractive new coworker. That's all that has happened so far, um, which is technically not a problem. I've enjoyed books that are like plotless before and the atmosphere that's being built isn't bad per se. It's, you know, very suffocating, very like small town, quiet nights, winter, snow crunching, the household that she lives in is like decrepit and rotting and filthy. There's an alcoholic father. Eileen herself works in a literal prison and will then leave these shifts to go into a town that's just as suffocating and maze-like and whatever. I get it. There's something there, but outside of like the package, the story itself to me doesn't feel great. <laughs> it doesn't elevate it <laughs> enough to me. Uh, because what's happening objectively isn't interesting and so the main appeal outside of like the atmosphere comes from seeing the darkness that Moshfeg will inject into the characters whether it's you know the father doing something really out of pocket or Eileen's narration just being offensive the way that she usually does this is just by making the most unlikable characters possible and my third time around with that approach, I feel a little more critical of it. What initially, when reading Moshfeg, can feel like her being subversive and cutting and snarky starts feeling to me more like lazy or reliant on shock value because these little moments of like shock value don't have a bigger message behind them. But these things that get a rise out of you feel more 
just like it's pointing at a taboo and not commenting any further on it than that starts to me feeling reactionary kind of lowbrow don't really have anything to comment on story-wise or like the book nothing has happened so far so hopefully in the last third things kind of culminate and i have something positive to say uh, what i will say so far is that i can see a movie version of this being good because it has such a strong sense of tone and style and i don't know i'm hopeful but so far the book not really enjoying it which is fine like it's it's okay um the next book also has a movie adaptation but it is shortcuts by raymond carver and the movie is directed by robert altman so another kind of short story collection raymond carver if you're unfamiliar is an american short story writer who i read for the first time earlier this year fell in love with his stuff um, the collection was called what we talk about when we talk about love and so for my second collection um, there were some repeats from the first one i'd read in this one so not all of it was new to me but there were i think there's 10 or something in this um and i think two of them i'd read before so of the eight that were new the eight were still kind of inconsistent um i think two of the stories that i read in this did not really land for me but the ones that did i thought were great and then the repeats are also ones that i had liked before so kind of at odds on how to rank this or like grade it so because these stories are so short and also just because i think carver's style kind of limits how much i can give away i think like explaining the premise of the stories would kind of give too much away so just going to kind of talk about at large what i think appeals to me about carver's writing the structure of them there's instead of like a traditional like bell graph of like rising action climax conclusion he kind of just cuts both of the sides off and just drops you in the middle of a story there's barely exposition and you just kind of get dropped into like a household most of his stories are about relationships between people in like middle America. So you'll kind of just get dropped into something like mid conversation and have to figure out things um, as it goes. It's really ambiguous. It definitely leaves questions unanswered, which adds like a layer of almost like surrealism and mystery to these very mundane people and events. The stories start feeling a bit surreal and off kilter just because they are grounded in reality, but they're obviously elevated. I mean, it's like a story playing out very quickly, but they're still rooted in like a truth of just strained relationships of conflict of interests and delivered in a way that's just, I don't know, thinking about them like gives me goosebumps, um, especially because of how much the endings just kind of pull the rug fr out from under you and just leave you to fill in every blank completely. Um, his writing itself, like literally also has of kind of vintage um, classic feel just because of the time that it was written which it's like late 70s early 80s and it's like a transition from like 50s 60s crime pulpy writing to like a more modernized fiction and not like contemporary fiction but it does feel dated in a way sometimes negatively um i think uh, <laughs> some of the stories and how they address race or just misogyny and like familial roles but that sort of like negative aspect is a minority of what i read maybe three stories out of the 20 something that i've read are kind of like that um but yeah just a heads up i think it's a good collection if you're into short stories themselves i highly recommend him as a writer i know i didn't you know really say what any of them are about but um if you read one with stories i feel like you'll understand why just because they are pretty unlike anything else that i've read like short story wise and it's not really about what happens in them it's like the feeling that he conveys so immediately and then can also just like rescind so immediately yeah just really really cool stuff there's like a level of like detachment as a writer but then also just i don't know a lot going on <laughs> speaking of books that i'm going to struggle to describe uh this is south and west by joan didion a book that I didn't really like, or a book that I wouldn't recommend, unfortunately. I think it was fine. Uh, okay, basically, what I did get out of this book was kind of outside of the book itself. Like, it was kind of like meta elements. Um, 
I think the main appeal of this collection is how candid and unedited it was. Context. Um, okay, so this book is a collection of two journal entries, I guess they would be, um, of Joan Didion that she kept. She essentially, she essentially kept a journal as she did this road trip throughout the south and western states of the U.S. So this was just kind of her notes that she was taking, and then they're just immediately published. In the foreword, I think they say explicitly that when she wrote this, she didn't have a story or like a structure in mind. And even if the foreword did not like back that directly, you can tell this is written really aimlessly and unstructured and like unedited just completely with it feels almost wrong to to like critique it because it's you know wasn't meant to be shown um which isn't to say it's bad writing i think on a sentence level it is super interesting and also it's not just like chicken scratch sort of like notes to self that are like unreadable there's like a story there's like it it is like elevated writing it reads like a rough draft or just entire spans of the trip feel out of place. I think mostly because things happen or you're, you're kind of recounted things in chronological order. It's not going to be connected from story to story thematically. And so reading it that way feels wrong, especially because she's writing it in the moment, like as things happen. And then also she's writing without a purpose in mind. Like she doesn't have an overarching theme or message or even like intention behind the trip it just feels so disconnected and all over the place until like the end of the book you know she doesn't kind of know like what the major takeaways of the trip are gonna be or even like when she's done with the entire road trip you know which which aspects which days she would choose to highlight in this you just kind of have to take everything in and some of the stuff definitely could have been filtered out or even just you know changed order I just don't think it should have been published or like delivered as if it was complete thoughts when it's obviously not. Um, I think if you're like a Didion completionist, you could probably get something out of this for sure. But I'm still early in like my reading of her stuff and this felt way too deep end for me. Um, I think the only way I would recommend this is if you are an aspiring writer and want like an exercise in how you would edit down something or like edit ideas there's probably some merit in reading this if you know you want to see why certain passages don't go together or even just use your attention span as a guide of when you're like recounting stories what to or you know not to highlight this book just wasn't really what i was expecting i started reading it liked it and then ended up listening to the audiobook uh when i went on a road trip for like three hours and yeah it just didn't it was, it was weird the next book is one that is definitely sneaking into like my favorites of the year right at the end and it is the argonauts by maggie nelson gorgeous book i read this like from the library and i had to buy my own copy so i can just have it annotated and like own it and give it to friends etc one of the most refreshing and accessible sort of like academic like theory heavy books that i've ever read i will not be able to do this justice in terms of the like shedding of pretense that goes on in this it is so deeply personal and vulnerable to the point where it feels like it was written with an audience like a readership um as like an afterthought the lens of writing for yourself or for herself um, through her own experiences out of necessity makes this really impactful and adds to the main thing that I loved while reading this, which is just the delivery. Um, so theme-wise, uh, the writing in this book centers around identity and her relationship, pregnancy, motherhood, queerness, um, death and grief to certain aspects. And as Maggie Nelson as a writer is prone to do, there are academic references to both literary theory and gender theory everywhere, like everywhere. <laughs> but the candidness of the surrounding book makes these references really palatable and readable because they're serving or in service to a regular conversation or like a candid scenario, just something that you can understand very clearly and then have that just highlight what she's talking about. 
Going back to how this was written with an audience as an afterthought, she does not care if you get it or not, which is part of why the delivery of this book was so refreshing, and I mean that in terms of like who she was writing to, um, because she was not trying to convince anyone to like join on board of like her thought process or like trying to like handhold and correct and convince. It was just I'm going to speak like from my perspective, and if you you know can't keep up, don't want to keep up stop reading because I'm not going to stop. An example of what I mean is her use of pronouns will change constantly in reference to the same person, which early on in the book, just in terms of like familiarity and like trying to make sense of everything that's being talked about, I caught myself personally getting like pretty hung up on just keeping up with like, wait, who are we talking about? Like what's happening? And her especially, you know, initially almost like making it a point to like buck you off this sense of like categorizing and like lumping these people that she's talking about like into, you know, certain boxes. The point of it being that Maggie Nelson as a person encourages like a very fluid identity and places very little value on being categorized and boxed in or labeled, which just goes on to infect the way that she writes about the people in her life. She'll never pause or like explain to the reader the details of her relationship in terms of gender roles or identity she just talks about her life in the moment as it happens and you're encouraged to buy into that same sense of understanding to me it brought to light a lot of preconceptions that we have and normative views that she challenges over and over and just encourages you to recognize your biases in kind of devaluing the elephant in the room until we question you know why we care in the first place what difference to me does it make what her husband was born as or if their kid was adopted if they used a donor what gender their kid is it just is so secondary and unimportant form wise too this book did a lot of things really well like hand in hand with delivery the last the last section of this book mirrors maggie giving birth versus her on her mother's deathbed and contrasting the feelings of both just so affecting so beautiful the entire book was really beautiful and thinky and self-referential and like this blend of memoir and queer theory and literary theory she's also like a professor just very up to date with a lot of like academia going on mixed with a lot of personal like experience that is just really powerful and moving and cool and awesome and this book was just yeah amazing really um highly recommend it it's gotten a ton of praise already so i don't think it's like an original thought to be like hey oh this book is pretty good but this book is pretty good and i liked it a lot um okay two more books to talk about both by the same author um ross gay so these two sort of varied in success for me, which I'm kind of bummed about because Ross Gay was another writer that I read for the first time earlier this year with The Book of Delights, which is now one of my favorite books ever. I really feel like there was a before and after in terms of just a life perspective that that book was able to give me in terms of giving reverence to the mundane sort of everyday joys that we receive constantly and tend to overlook just i don't know i've talked about it to death it's a really amazing book though and so five years later um he released a sequel the book of more delights which has i think 80 something essays in this um and the sort of premise of both books is that for a year he'll write an essay um every day about one delightful thing that happens and he's a great writer and because they're so candid and like immediate, um, there's a lot of like romanticization going on and linking it to childhood memories or experience that he had with like a parent or like a song or etc. Sad to report that this was probably my least favorite Ross Gay book that I've read so far. Not a bad book, but the bar is just set so high for me. Uh, to me, the main difference between volume two and volume one because on paper, you know, they should be kind of similar, but was the weight of the essays. These, um, these all felt very 
consumable, um, almost trite, I guess. Reading the first volume, it would be like every few I would need to stop and collect myself because some revelation that he came to or like some sort of like mental gymnastics of romanticizing a very negative event would just like restructure my like neurons and be like, whoa, I'm having a brain blast and life is actually in my control versus this where I was able to read a lot of essays in one sitting because they never really ended on a gut punch or like a huge ending like you know message like call to action that I felt like I needed to pause and sort of work my way through they were all pleasant but never really exceeded being just pleasant they're also not super memorable like I don't think I could name a specific essay in this collection that wowed me whereas some of the ones in volume one which moved me a bunch I can still kind of you know remember the point of like an opening woo that's that's an essay and I don't know. It was a fine book. It's not like I regret reading it, but lifted my mood, did not change my life, which I can kind of count on Roske to do consistently. So disappointed. Okay, so second Roske book that I read and way better. It was kind of more classic Roske in terms of like very affecting essays, but the package itself was something that I've never sort of like experience with him because in the book of delights the essays are sometimes even just like one page or like two to five pages but very short and then there's so many of them uh, whereas in this instead of there being bordering on a hundred essays there's only 14 and the length of them is way longer so some of them are like 40 pages or another one's like 50 there's just way more real estate to work with he has a lot more room to and time to build up his ideas um, because another aspect of the Book of Delights is their daily, whereas this was written over a very long period of time and tackles a lot bigger themes. Yeah, this is like completely unconstrained. This is super referential and like footnoted and annotated. Yeah, these essays just come across as super hefty and layered and intricate. These essays all come together and like, you know, take their time going on tangents, but relate and wrap up super masterfully. It reminded me reading this that I was like, oh yeah, this this dude is a professor, just like straight up, and not just a person who is really in touch with beauty and his feelings and his emotions. So many of these essays made me like ugly cry in public. I was being moved very heavily, and when I wasn't sobbing, I was just really bought in and entertained by the ideas that he was bringing up, the insights he had, the references to things that weren't super academic, like stand-up specials or shows or songs and and one essay in particular was like the 40-ish page one uh, about academics and him talking about being a professor and a teacher and talking about the constraints that he feels of teaching and grading and kind of exploring what purposes he is serving like as you know someone in academia and the idea of uniformity in education the ties of that to like capitalism as like a structure goes in a ton of directions at some point he starts talking about like amazon warehouses and like the kind of similarities to both i just thought it was super good um there's like a ton of references to books as well which i ended up buying a few which um sounded interesting to me uh, one of which i think i've already talked about but anyways i'm even getting tangential just talking about the book and uh, that's a, another big part of why i think these like as essays work so well is because they're super readable and tangential and like conversational they're full of footnotes i think i've already said but but sometimes the footnotes will get so long that they end up taking up multiple pages at a time and becoming these like nested mini essays and these big concepts just are being spoken about in a way that's super anecdotal and conversational. It's as if you're talking to a friend, like you interrupt yourself, you get tangential, you'll make references to songs and stand-up comedy and be like, oh, yeah, I forgot we were talking about blank, and then, you know, keep it moving. It just feels so effortless and candid, which is a huge compliment for like an essay collection, which I think a lot of people are kind of intimidated by the idea of but yeah this is just super amazing book and another lens of roske as a writer which i hadn't experienced it of something long form and yeah he does both really well whether it's short or long form that was a great book and um 
yeah so one Roske book that I was disappointed by and the other was a very pleasant surprise with that being said I have to go watch Eileen later so I need to read the book be right back okay there you go. Uh, I'm done with the book and I'm about to go watch the movie in like 10 minutes so you're just kind of thoughts as I transition between the two uh, book wise I am underwhelmed uh, for sure no spoilers well I can avoid it but throughout the book there's like so much allusion to her life changing or like the day it all changed and if only I knew then what I know now like this would be my last time doing whatever it just really builds up whatever the climax is going to end up being and this sort of mysterious co-worker that she meets who is like the catalyst for change in her life ends up being super flat pacing wise they talk for the first time and then the climax is just the next time that they meet it just all felt like unearned and too literal i don't know just overall would not say i like the book but despite that i am not going into the movie with low expectations because reading this i do think that the premise could work way better visually or just less like verbally i don't know if the movie's going to be like voiceover narration but i'm hoping for something that's more just show don't tell to build up this sort of quieter like a more subtle sense of unease and dread instead of just these very like abrasive like off-putting internal thoughts or kind of more like on the nose moments um especially with how much of the book is just trying to convey a sense of atmosphere of tone i think it could just be done way easier and like better if it was just like through like a movie version what a weird sentence yeah pacing wise just cutting out this sort of monotony or like the length of the intro where in the book i think it's like 150 pages and then there's only like two events there's like two major events in the book period so yeah just having that sort of like three stage arc 90 minute movie it makes sense basically I'm about to go watch it. I have to leave now, basically, but I have hope for the movie. I can picture a version of what I just read that works. Fingers crossed. Unfortunately, I do not vouch for the Eileen movie, and I'm bummed about that because I was hoping this was like a fringe case where the movie would be better than the book. I don't think so. And it's not for any legitimate reason. Like, I don't think stylistically or story-wise or, like, adaptation, like, things not lining up. It was more just one central complaint of, like, relying on jump scares and, like, shock value in order to get a rise out of you or, like, build any tension and emotion, which is just, like, such a cop-out and, like, a lazy way of filmmaking where it's essentially the director admitting, I don't know how to create the emotion I'm looking for, so I'm just going to scare you and move on. And, like, that counts as it being, like, a thriller, or it being, like, suspenseful. And it's not. It's just you betraying the audience trust over and over and showing, like, something graphic, just super loud noise, gunshot, whatever it is. And then every time that you see a gun from then on, you're like, are you going to do it again? Because they do it, like, four times, just as a heads up. And so you know by time three and four you're just bracing and it's like this I, this just isn't fair i don't know anyways did not like that aspect and um it just makes the entire movie feel like cheap to me um but stylistically sonically whatever whatever there were still some good things going for it until i was just like not <laughs> on its side anymore uh, the one major advantage that i feel like the movie has is just music which kind of just forgot how easy it is to like period piece 60s music equals scary and like off-putting and like kind of haunted dilapidated and so yeah whether it be like christmas carol or like random songs of the jukebox really atmospheric cheat code easy um, the lighting was also good although in my head the movie would have been like white and blue it's like a christmas movie i was like oh winter they're snowed in um, but there were a lot of like yellow and like sepia whatever tones which looked really pretty there are two scenes in particular i don't know if they're in the trailer if they are i'll put them on screen but one of just like driving at night super low exposure the only thing you can see is like headlights and like a hazy outline of a car um, like head on as it's driving on a road looked really great on screen and then there's also one scene where anne hathaway's character is like half lit on like a window 
it's like stained glass yellow really pretty also um lighting wise like tonally there were some moments where i was like really on board with it. i was like oh this looks cool i'm into it um musically like i said pretty good um story-wise there are some differences which i'm not like anti you know adaptation like taking liberties um the book is not like a bible but they are like pretty central things that you're changing um namely the narrator being unlikable uh, in the book it's very much like that's the point and that's why you get so many like offensive internal monologues um but in the movie you don't get any like internality and so Eileen as a character ends up coming off across a lot more pitiable and less like, you know, <laughs> unlikable or like unsalvageable as like a person. Uh, in this, it's very like they're hapless, they're demure, they're kind of like being taken in, like taken advantage of by those around them. Uh, you definitely like lean into like sympathizing with them more, which I thought was interesting. Um, again, it doesn't like super change that much, although there's a choice or like an event that happens at the end again no spoilers but in the book it's meant to be like an accident or like just something that happens and uh, in the movie they're very like clear but like it was a choice and i wanted to do that and i think that also like kind of changes the alignment of the character in terms of like being unlikable and then things going out of their control or, or like being pitiable and then them choosing to do it like the motive behind it and like the messaging of like agency you know acting on your own like impulses um it just changes um let me think so another thing that improved movie wise was the pacing um i kind of mentioned it beforehand that i was hoping that things could kind of move a little faster was not prepared for how fast they were going to move the mysterious co-worker character shows up in the first five minutes like it, they're not you know beating around the bush at all they're like okay like let's let's make the movie and uh, I was on board with that. I was like, okay, cool. Just like give them time to like breathe and then, you know, have like the two nights that they interact be like the rest of the movie. And that's what it was. Um, there were still some certain scenes like highlighted directly from the book, which like showcased the father daughter relationship or just, you know, her happenings in life. It's hard to like adapt something that's like this uh, listless at times into something being like super snappy and like pacey. Um, so I was, you know, pleased on that aspect. And spoiler free wise, I think that's like about <laughs> all I want to say. Um, I'm down to like talk about it if you've seen it like in DMs or whatever. Um, but I don't want to just like en masse spoil something, especially because it's like opening weekend, you know, I'll give you all time to watch it, read it, whatever you want to do. Um, but I am curious if you haven't read the book, if you watch the movie, like, you know, without having read the book, what do you think? Because I've feel like for me the big draw of like a lot of the scenes in the movie were like oh that's like a reference to blank or like oh that's how they're depicting blank uh, it was just interesting to see like choice wise what they were doing or like you know where they went with it because Moshvig did write the screenplay I was like oh well she'll have like a hand in it guide it whatever whatever um, as like a complete outsider I wonder what people will think of this movie it's kind of similar plot wise to Carol that one like What's her name? Kate Blanchett, uh, Christmas movie. It's also like kind of like the same trope of like demure, hapless, nobody brunette meets this like lipstick lesbian blonde who is like self-assured and like gives them direction. And then, oh, there's like risks of violence and love and sapphism and whatever. Um, and it's also Christmas themed. So there are some like overlaps to movies that people have liked, but I don't know if people will like this movie i'm curious to see just like general audience wise what people think um and then also if you like have read you know how they compare to each other but mm, book wise i think i would give eileen like a two and a half probably um i don't think i'll ever like return to this i didn't dislike it super in the moment but it did feel kind of passive and just normal like average that was like fine uh, and then the movie i would probably give two stars where I do just not like the sort of like mindless jump scare. Um, there's some like aesthetic things I like, but maybe even like a one and a half. Um, I mean, I just saw it, so I'm still kind of digesting, but those are some things either I noticed or just, you know, my opinion. But um, yeah, that's, that's Eileen. Um, and that's kind of the video as a whole. Um, thanks for watching. Goodbye.